Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are excited to be welcoming back a returning guest who has been on this show a number of times, starting in 2017. The first time he was here, Bitcoin was roaring. It was the retail mania and all sorts of behaviors were taking place that sometimes lead to bubbles. Then the opposite occurred. He came back to the show in 2018 and the crypto atmosphere was nasty and brutal. But now in 2019, it has brought with it the institutional progress for the very first time. Backed Futures, Libra, and presidential mentions on Twitter definitely indicate that we have entered new territory in this industry. Our guest today is Mr. Trace Mayer. Trace is an entrepreneur, an investor, a journalist who ferociously defends freedom of speech. He holds degrees in both accounting and law, and he is the host of the extremely popular podcast, Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. Trace, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Oh, great. Thanks so much for having me. It's always uh, fun to talk about our magic internet money. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And lots of stuff occurring. Oh, my gosh, this industry is exploding. Trace, you have always held the position that Bitcoin is the best form of money, thanks to decentralization, among other benefits. Do you believe that Bitcoin's network effect will keep growing now that Libra for example, is competing with it. And how does the entrance of 28 giants into the cryptocurrency space contribute to Bitcoin's future as we continue to see much more institutional buying? Yeah, so first, Libra and Bitcoin, they aren't even the same type of thing. One is centralized, uh, can be censored, your account could be shut down. Uh, the other is global, decentralized, uh, censorship resistant, the hardest money in the world. It's strictly limited in amount. The other one, like they can just create as many of whatever's they want as, as they want to do. So they're totally different, uh, totally different things. In fact, Libra uh, could actually hold Bitcoin uh, within it, you know, just like they're going to hold oil or, uh, or, or, or at least price exposure to oil or, or wheat or uh, other assets. So, you know, they're not even the same type of thing. Uh, and, a Bitcoin, you know, where you're able to ha run your own full node and hold your own private keys, uh, that's a big deal because it gives you monetary sovereignty. And it's the hardest money in the world. Look at the difficulty adjustment algorithm. And so I think that the Bitcoin network effects are going to continue to take root. They're, they're taking root. They're exponentially reinforcing each other. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a bright future all the way around. To have Facebook, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, the new head, Christine Lagarde of the ECB, uh, Treasury Secretary Munchen, President Trump, all of these people within a week, like making Bitcoin a political question, uh, introducing it to become an election issue in 2020. Uh, I mean, this is going to be kind of wild to watch. I mean, Bitcoin's only 10 years old and it's already this type of a monster uh, in terms of the liquidity, the scalability, and the security. It is unparalleled. Nothing's even close to it. Uh, so, you know, it's not going away. Uh, and it poses this uh, ability for millennials to transfer huge amounts of wealth that are currently stored in other assets to holders of Bitcoin. So, you know, that's, a, that's another thing that should not be underestimated because the millennials are stepping onto the political stage and they're claiming, uh, you know, just a lot of influence uh, both politically and now economically. And so, you know, we're just in a time of change and it's, uh, it's exciting. Yeah, um, millennials are certainly going to be a force to be reckoned with. I think a lot of people sort of discount that when you hear um, a lot of commentators, especially in the mainstream media, even Fox talking about, oh, you know, um, everything nothing to worry about. Everything's going to stay status quo. These are just very few people represented and they are not going to have an impact. I think they're greatly underestimating what's about to come, wouldn't you say? Well, well there, there are 116 voting age millennials versus something like 78 million baby boomers. Baby boomers are dying every day. They're on the way out. Uh, the millennials are inheriting that wealth. 
why keep it in a fraudulent stock market where there's just market, we don't have markets anymore, just manipulations. Uh, Treasury Secretary Munchen mentioned this in his press in his press conference. He talked about the president's working group on financial markets. You know what they do? They were formed after the, the 1987 crash. They're there to manipulate the markets to restore confidence. So they can buy and manipulate any type of asset, basically. That's what he's talking about. I mean, it's, it's really kind of crazy. And, you know, the only way you can manipulate Bitcoin's price right now is up because it's only 200 billion market cap and there's not much there. But Bitcoin's different from all of the other assets that you might try to manipulate because it's strictly limited in amount. And the, pri the cost to run a Bitcoin full node to ver verify your own transactions, holding your own private keys, that cost is very low relative to like running a gold full node. And you don't even get to run uh, like shares of stock in Apple or whatever. You don't get to run one of those full nodes. So like, you know, millennials, they, I mean, look at just the, the difference in thinking. Baby boomers came of age with a booming economy, a booming stock market, all-time low housing prices, very high interest rates. There was never a greater time to accumulate capital than what the baby boomers grew into. My father, for example, he graduated college. He earned 25.7 ounces of gold per month at his first job out of college. That's $500,000 a year. But because of our monetary system and the fractional reserve banking and our, uh, the UCC with how they deal with ownership of stock certificates and other equities and rehypothecation, and now we have all-time low interest rates, we had the 2007 financial crisis, we have all-time highs in student debt, we have all-time high housing prices, like the millennials have gotten totally screwed compared to the baby boomers. And so what is, what is the one asset that's not manipulated by this president's working group on financial markets? The plunge protection team is the name of it. Mm -hmm. And it's Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, a plunge protection team like that. Wow. Like, pri you want to acquire assets when they're cheap. They're keeping prices artificially high, which are pricing millennials out of being able to acquire wealth. So what are, what, what's the option for millennials? You know, and, and you couple it with all the trust that's been lost in a fourth turning. You know, cypherpunks don't trust, verify. Don't, millennials, they don't trust banks. They don't trust cor corporations. They don't trust governments or institutions. They don't trust any of this crap. Why would they? Why would, why, 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 why would, why would why anyone? Would <laughs> yeah, I mean, why would anyone? I mean, maybe baby boomers because they grew up being coddled with like all these economic tailwinds. But mm -hmm. millennials have had only economic and political and corporate headwinds. And so they're looking for an option out of that system. And that's where Bitcoin comes into play. You know, and this isn't just, I mean, it's not just magic internet money. I mean, this is triple entry bookkeeping, first time practically implemented. It's going to be a massive, it's, it's a once in a species event, you know? And so as we're in this fourth turning, like millennials have a question to ask themselves, are they going to buy some Bitcoin just to have some in case it catches on like Satoshi recommended, or are they going to get left behind being stuck in an old system where they're being priced out with a plunge protection team that doesn't let the asset prices come down you know, so, so they, they're, they're buying stuff expensively and then it's going to lose value anyways because the price is artificially being propped up. I mean, millennials got to, they got to ask themselves some serious questions and they got to take personal responsibility because, you know, if there's one thing that the baby boomers have done, it's just bail out everybody. You know, they bailed out, they bailed out the banks, they bailed out their kids, letting them live on their couch and in their basement. Like Bitcoin, you don't get bailed out anymore. Because how do you get the resources? You can't just print them out of nothing, right? No, no more fractional reserve banking. Like the Bitcoin is just going to be brutal in allocating these gains and losses. And it's going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people, especially if those people have like resorted to getting bailed out. And so I think we're into time for a huge amount of political change, economic change, financial change. Uh, but Bitcoin, it's just, I mean, it's a kind of an unstoppable monster now in terms of all its network effects. So it's very exciting time to be alive. And I don't know what 
Donald Trump is thinks he's doing, like attacking a bunch of money badgers. You know, they're they're honey badgers attacking their money. Like that's about the dumbest thing I can think of to do politically. Um, I mean, maybe maybe he wants to generate discussion and then flip uh, during the election year. I don't know, but like it's it's not a very wise thing to do politically. You know, because he says even in his tweet, he's like, you know, it's the U.S. dollar. No, no, no. It's, that's the Federal Reserve note. And that is an unconstitutional uh, monetary instrument under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. And there's no power in Article 1, Section 8 to give the federal government power to make anything legal tender. And under 60, you know, Executive Order 6102, Franklin Roosevelt made holding gold illegal. The legislature uh, came along and, and re-legalized it in 1975, but only after it had been demonetized. And then in 1991, in City versus Dover, the U.S. Supreme Court could have heard the issue of what is a dollar, but they refused to hear the case. So all three branches of government have shirked their constitutional duty when it comes to sound money. And it's sound money that made America great. You know, it was the dollar that was 371.25 grains of fine silver. And that's still on the books, actually, under 31 U.S.C. 5101 through 5118, along with the other unconstitutional money like Federal Reserve notes. But like th this is the type of discussion that Trump has now opened the can on. Like what is money and what is constitutional money and what's going to make America great again? Right. It's it's going to be a return to sound money like America is in this in this choice because it's the collapse of a worldwide global monetary and, and economic system that's happening. And we either are going to have repression or regeneration. Repression would be not being a fan of Bitcoin and being mm -hmm. draconian on it, right? Which is, which is like what Munchen and, and Trump have kind of floated regeneration is going the route that the founding fathers went with having freedom of speech and sound money. And cryptography has already been upheld as freedom of speech in the mid nineties. So he's got an uphill battle if he thinks he's going to make Bitcoin illegal because the Supreme court's going to say no. Uh, and so, you know, we're in this, we're in this just huge amount of change and he swore an oath to uphold and defend the constitution. And General Milley, who's now second in command behind Trump, he said that the armed services, their oath to uphold the Constitution is not to uphold a particular leader, but to uphold the Constitution. And there's a difference. Right? Yes. And, and, there's a, and there's a difference. And so when President Trump does a press conference about having social media and freedom of speech, and then the very same day attacks sound money that's based on freedom of speech with cryptography, there's cognitive dissonance there. So, you know, Trump either let somebody ghostwrite that tweet or Trump is being very smart, generating a bunch of discussion to flip on the issue. But it, it sounds to me that it's a very bad idea to alienate the armed services and to retard the U.S.'s national security ability when it comes to having and using the soundest money the greatest, you know, that's, that's the greatest technological advancement, this difficulty adjustment algorithm that's in Bitcoin. Like, th this is a big deal. And when China and India were the le last to adopt gold, which was the previous hardest money, they lost 72% of their net worth. So monetary repression, as opposed to monetary regeneration, th this is a, a stark path that America can choose between. And so when he, you know, attacks freedom of speech and money, sound money, uh, by going after Bitcoin and, and introducing this cognitive dissonance, he's alienating these armed service members who actually have been able to buy Bitcoin earlier than pretty much anyone else because there was a deal between Coinbase and USAA like six, seven years ago. So they've had a lot of opportunity to acquire Bitcoin, the armed services have. Uh, but also, we've got approximately 8 to 10 million unique AML KYC verified American Bitcoin users on various exchanges out of 124 million votes. So yeah, that makes a great idea. Like, let's go attack 
the sound money that these people are holding and do it in an unconstitutional way. That sounds like a recipe to lose an election to me. And so, like, I, I mean, maybe he's getting bad advice from different advisors. Maybe he doesn't understand what Bitcoin is. Maybe he doesn't understand the demographic trends that are all going. Although, from what I understand, Bannon was, like, understood the fourth turning and liked the book and thought we were in the midst of, of a fourth turning. So, you know, th this is... What one thing Trump is good at is generating discussion and controversy. So maybe it's intentional to generate a bunch of discussion around sound money and, and you know, because how else do we get rid of the Federal Reserve note? And so, you know, th this is, it's going to be very interesting to see how all this plays out. And, and everybody gets to play in the war by voting with their money. You can either buy Bitcoin or not right? Like you can join, everybody gets to join in the revolution uh, if we're going to retake sound money. And it goes one by one, person by person. And you get to determine like what you do. And, and then we have the happening that happens in June next year, like six months, a, a few months before the election. And, you know, in a possible massive bull market into the six figures. So, I mean, all of this could just be like, wow, you know, just, <laughs> I mean, what a time to be alive. I mean, the baby boomers thought they had it good, like getting to be involved in all the civil rights movements. We get to be involved in restoring sound money. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it really is. And you bring up an interesting perspective because I've thought about that sometimes too. Trump seems to play dumb sometimes, in my opinion. You know what I mean? He seems to say things that he knows are wrong just to get people fired up. But that tactic does, it, it, it sort of grows negativity. You know, it gets people against him. It's like, what, what are you doing? And that's a very slippery slope once you start that. If you play, you know what I mean? If you play dumb and take this side and then people are against you so that you just get the topic roaring people can actually genuinely believe that that's your perspective. He's done that on a number of different things. So yeah. it's really interesting to watch him. I mean, that, that tweet he sent out had 20,000 comments. Like my, my comment where I pointed out, hey, Federal Reserve notes are unconstitutional and uh, a dollar is based on silver and that's sound money and Bitcoin is sound money and, and that's what made America great. That response had something like 80,000 impressions. Yeah. And so his tweet generated tens of millions of impressions, maybe hundreds of millions, like globally. So, I mean, he really lit a fire under the discussion <laughs> of what, what sound money is, you know, and there are a lot of Bitcoiners out there who are yapping a lot about it. <laughs> Free and, brought out everybody. <laughs> and so, and now, now, you know, it's not like gold, you know, because the gold bugs have been talking about it for decades. They've carried that torch and, you know, I was a, I was a, run to gold.com as my site before Bitcoin was invented. Mm -hmm. well, you know, so I'm a fan of, I'm a fan of gold and silver. I think that they're not barbarous commodities, but they're essential checks and balances in the political machinery. And they belong in the same class as constitutions and bills of right, you know, so, kind of like freedom of speech. And so, but Bitcoin's the next iteration of this. And so he's like, as the leader of the free world, and that's literally what Donald means is like ruler of the world. Like, I mean, does it's, that, mean, does that name? That's, mean? Yeah, that's what his name means. I mean, it's really kind of wild. So, as and like the, the leader, last name Trump. Trey. Yeah, I mean, it, he just like trumps everything. <laughs> but, but the problem with Bitcoin is like, if he doesn't get on the Bitcoin train, like he might get trumped by Bitcoin because you know the economy matters, but sound money matters more, especially when it's you've got returns. You know, I mean. Bitcoiners are sitting on massive, massive returns, you know, like you want to stimulate the economy. How about you take a bunch of money from quantitative easing recipients and give it to the average person who's buying Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. You know, then they have a bunch of discretionary money to spend and hey, let's become a fan of Bitcoin and like, and, and exempt it from capital gains Ooh, tax, right? That would be so like. So, I mean, maybe, like, maybe he's generating the discussion. Maybe he has no idea, like, the can of worms he opened. But he is very savvy when it comes to tacking into different political wins. And there's already been uh, different legislation floated in the House and the Senate about exempting Bitcoin from capital gains in certain types of ways. So, you know, 
make that a pillar of your of your of your reelection campaign. You know, you want to jumpstart the economy. Why don't you make Why don't you make uh, twenty to thirty Americans uh, multi multi millionaires through a wealth transfer via Bitcoin? You know, from all this thirteen trillion dollars of negative yielding government debt, like. Yeah, then then you'll then you'll leave a real legacy, you know, because you're going to transfer all that wealth to Americans, and that that's that would only be good for national security purposes, because you know we'd have the money. I mean, you want to encourage your citizenry to have the sound money instead of discourage and prevent them. Like Bolivia, you know, they made the, Bolivia and Ecuador making Bitcoin illegal. Well, guess what? Their their people are just going to be repressed financially. That was really gonna, disappointing. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're not going to be rich. Like, you, you need, you want a rich citizenry because rich citizenry, they can spend lots of money and you can use that to fund uh, the military and other stuff. Like, you don't have a rich citizenry. Uh, you, like, you got a problem, you know? So, uh, so it, I mean, these are all fun political issues and Bitcoin is... Uh, seems to be a mirror that everybody gets to see their own reflection in when it comes to, uh, and so there's a lot of cognitive dissonance and stuff like that associated with it. But Bitcoin's not going away and it's got massive network effects. So like, what's you going to do? <laughs> exactly. I want to turn back just for a moment to Libra because it's the huge topic right now. And if you went a little bit into this. I'd really like you to explain to everybody the difference between Bitcoin and Libra and the fact that Libra is not actually a competitor of Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, Libra is a centralized coin issued by Facebook. It can be censored. They're going to be collecting a bunch of da data on its usage uh, and probably using that to, to screw you over on how stuff gets priced or what, what gets uh, presented to you. Um, it has to act within the regulatory uh, framework. It's not a fundamental protocol at the base layer like Bitcoin is. Uh, you know, on the other side, Bitcoin, it's a global digital store of value. It's not correlated. It has asymmetric return potential. It's immutable. So you can't change it. Libra, they want to change your balance. They can just change your balance just like that. You know, they control that database. Uh, Bitcoin's got the hardest cap supply, so it's inflation proof. No confiscation through inflation. Can't be confiscated because you're holding the private keys yourself. It's decentralized and it's censorship resistant. And so Libra and Bitcoin are just totally different animals. Uh, that's not to say that Libra won't be successful or that it won't even push forward, uh, you know, adoption of digital currency and virtual currency and stuff like this. But it, it doesn't even play in the same realm uh, as Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going after that store of value uh, as the first network effect of speculation. You know, and then other layers on top of it, like Lightning Network and, uh, and, and Liquid and stuff like this, those will be additional layers uh, that increase Bitcoin's usability. So that extensibility. Libra, on the other hand, it wants to have to do with the price of other assets that goes into a basket. So it's much more like an SDR, a special drawing right, than it is like Bitcoin. Um, and, it, and, and, it, and it's censorable. Like, what, what you gonna do? Like, get Mt. Goxed again? Like, I mean, it's just, like, why trust Facebook? I mean, they've already proven to be, like, pretty antithetical to your own interest. So, you know, that's another, another thing is, like, it requires so much trust uh, in Facebook and, and the other entities, whereas Bitcoin is trustless. You can run your own full node. You know, you can hold your own private keys. Like, you don't have to trust anybody. You can use a freaking satellite to download the blockchain. Like, how cool is that? Like, anywhere. You know, you, like, you, you can be using Bitcoin in a way that no one knows you're using it because you're not going through an ISP or whatever or the Great Firewall of China. Like, Libra? Huh. Like, they're going to be stopped. Like, right at the Great Firewall of China and going to do whatever the Chinese government wants them to do or, or the U.S. government or like, oh, that's going to be fun. You know, Facebook getting pulled on by both the U.S. and the Chinese government, <laughs> like Google is now, right? right. Like, it's just, <laughs> like, why do you want to trust that type of uh, insanity? It just is, like, I'd rather just trust math and computer science and thermodynamics. 
<laughs> I just wanted you, yeah, it, you just make such great points in that the fact that it's owned by Facebook. So people, if people compare, you know, or you know, one of, obviously, one of the 28, one of the big ones, um, compare uh, Libra to Bitcoin, it's just so diametrically opposites it's actually like it's it's the institutions of the world that have stolen the money and stolen the identity and sold your data and made a whole lot of money off of you now coming into the cryptocurrency space and competing with bitcoin it's just sort of like um, i i do i do think it's freaking awesome that silicon valley and wall street are locked in this mortal combat with each other <laughs> True. you know like you know, Bitcoin, meanwhile, is like, you know, the new mammal that's running around. You got all these nation state dinosaurs and you got big tech and Wall Street and like Bitcoin's the mammal that's like just trying not to get stepped on. Right. <laughs> Except now it's like a pretty darn big mammal, like $80 billion a day of global trade volume. That that puts it around the Swedish krona. You know, it puts it like a top 10 currency in terms of the Forex markets. In terms of liquidity and, and we, got, we got a swap execution facility, DCO, that's turning to, into a DCM with Ledger X. So that's fully collateralized wow. uh, on the puts and call options. I mean, like Bitcoin's got serious infrastructure in all seven of these network effects. Uh, and, and guess what? Like Ledger X is US. It's CFTC regulated. Right. Right. So like, like okay, so you don't trust the dollar and you trust Bitcoin, well, if the dollar and Bitcoin are very freely convertible to each other, in a way, Bitcoin will add confidence to the dollar mm -hmm. because you, you feel that you're safe. You can get out of the dollar into Bitcoin if you need to. So you'll, you'll feel safer in Bitcoin. I mean, would you really want to be a Deutsche Bank customer right now? <laughs> no, really. They got, 40, right. they got $45 trillion of counterparty risk with derivatives. Deutsche Bank does. Mm -hmm. And they're having a billion dollars a day of, of withdrawals happening. Like, when are the gates going to go up? Mm -hmm. when, are you, when, when are you going to be trapped in Deutsche Bank? Right. Right. No just, like Mount, just like Mount Gox. Right. Like, for real. For real. Like, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Like, look, look, at, look at Wells Fargo's net interest income. You know, and, and what happens when the interest rates get lowered by PAL? What happens to the bank's net interest income? whether it's Wells Fargo or Bank of America, like for real, you want to be a counterparty of these, of these institutions or, or do you want to own something that can't be confiscated either directly or through inflation? Because that, that's how, that's what's going to happen. I mean, it's going to be inflation. You know, they're just going to modern monetary theory. They're just going to keep printing stuff out of the federal reserve and out of the ECB and out of the JCB. It's called competitive devaluation. That's how this like Trump and tariffs and trade wars and currency wars and like all of it leads to massive amounts of inflation to play games, right? Monetary games like, and, and Bitcoin's global. Like any, I mean, we've got 200 plus exchanges that do over a billion dollars a month of volume in different, in different markets and stuff, crypto exchanges. So, I mean, th this is a multi, multi trillion dollar game for real. Like, and it's going to, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to be stuck in the old system or you're going to move a small percentage of your net worth into, into Bitcoins or maybe even a large percentage. I mean, everybody's got to make their own decisions and economic calculation is going to be brutal in allocating the gains and losses. Like, you calculate incorrectly, you're going to end up like Peter Schiff. You mm -hmm. calculate correctly, you're going to end up like me. <laughs> No, really. Like Peter, I, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, Peter and I were like uh, the, the other, the Kenneth and Daniel, we were at a Palm Springs conference and Peter Schiff walked by and I'd known him. So we were going to talk about it. Bitcoin's $13. And he didn't want to do an interview on camera because I'd make him look stupid. Right? Like who are you going to listen to? You're going you're gonna to have Peter Schiff manage your money? Wow. Or, or are you going to get some Bitcoin at 13 bucks? It goes to 13,000. <laughs> right? right, or from thirteen thousand to like a hundred or two hundred fifty thousand. I mean, I was the first person to put out a multi-million dollar price target on Bitcoin. Okay, I want to go into that. What's your target right now, and what's your time frame? Uh, well, I think I think for the rest of the year we might have a correction and consolidation. We've had a lot of run up. Uh, Preston from the Investors Podcast coined the term "the Mayor Multiple" based on my thoughts on the two hundred day moving average. 
Uh, so mayormultiple.com or mayormultiple.info. Uh, people put up sites about it. You know, Mayor Multiple was 0.54 in like January, February, March timeframe. That you should have bought, right? Like Mayor Multiple is that low. It shows that it's cheap. You should have bought at $3,500. Now Mayor Multiple, it, when it, well, when Bitcoin was like 12,000 bucks a couple days ago, Mayor Multiple is up around 2.2x. Hmm. You know, so you want to buy when it's really low and sell when it's, it's relatively high. And so we have to have this 200 day moving average catch up. It's only at like $5,900 and it's rising like $40 a day. So you give it another 80 days, two, two or three, two and a half, three months. Hmm. Uh, that's going to be another $3,200. Now we're up to like, you know, uh, $9,000 200 day moving average. Maybe it gets up to nine, ten, $11,000 on the 200 day moving average. And then we have another run to like three or four X, uh, the 200 day moving average over a six to eight month period. You could be looking at six figure Bitcoin for real, like in the middle of the election next year. Like it could be a major political issue because tens of millions of people will have a lot of money at stake in their Bitcoin. Like they don't care what you're blabbing about. Like we got to save the climate and, and ride tauntauns, right? Like Senator Mike Lee making fun of the, the Green New Deal. Like they're not, they're, they're not going to care about that. They're going to they're gonna care about, are you going to take 20% of my 80,000 bucks that I made on my Bitcoin? Like I made a $100,000 gain on my Bitcoin capital gain. Are you going to take 20% of that capital gains tax? Or are you going to run on a platform of, of, of repealing capital gains tax or, or exempting Bitcoin from, from it. You so know, you're I really mean, believing the, the, the six figures around November of 2020 and um, talk about regulations. Do you think, cause right now we're sort of enjoying well, a little bit of a grace period. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, between like, you know, 2020 and 2021 mm -hmm. and 2022, I mean, these are, there's just so much converging. We've got the DCM with Ledger X. We've got backed. We've got all-time high trading volumes. We've got uh, more more AML KYC accounts than ever. I mean, put it in perspective. We have 35 million globally AML KYC unique accounts in Bitcoin. In 2017, we only had something like two million, right? And the and the previous bubble before that, we had less than a million. So, I mean, the order of magnitudes in terms of number of people that are growing and how many times has, Bit has Bitcoin been in the news for making all-time highs and how many people have missed it, you know, because they just didn't figure out how to do, uh, how, to, how to buy any or, they, you know, they just didn't do the work. I mean, FOMO's real. I mean, it's for real. Like, look at the internet bubble, right? Like, what you going to do? You're going to sit by, like, when Bitcoin hits 20,000, 20, a new all-time high, What's going to happen to the average person that's hearing about it, like in the news? Mm. They didn't buy it when it hit 1,300. They didn't buy it when it hit 20,000. And now it's at 20,000. Now it's at 25,000. Like, what are they going to do? It's too expensive. Yeah. I mean, everybody loves to chase the rabbit. Yeah, but you can buy infinitely can buy divisible portions. Mm -hmm. portions of Bitcoin, you know? Sure. So someone might be like, you know what? I need to buy some just in case it becomes something, like Satoshi said. Yeah. Most definitely. And they need to watch the mayor multiple and sort of gauge where they can come in. Yeah, but they're not going to do that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> because, some because, people here might. Yeah, um, well, Bit Bitcoin acts as both a Giffen good and a Veblen good. So with transactions, uh, as the price goes up, you need you, people demand more Bitcoin to use it to pay transaction fees. Mm -hmm. And also, as the price goes up, people want to buy more of it, you know, because that's just kind of human psychology. So Bitcoin is both a Giffen good and a Veblen good, where as the, Bitcoin, as the price goes up, its fundamental usage requires more, more purchases of Bitcoin and the store of value use case in, results in more purchases of Bitcoin. And since it's strictly limited in amount, being the hardest, soundest money the world's ever known, you can't just produce more of it. Like if this happened to the price of corn, like everybody be farming corn. Right. Like if it happened to the price of gold, every single potential gold mine would be out producing gold. But like you don't get to do that with Bitcoin. And, and with gold, it would take years for that new supply to come online. You know, it's harder money than, than corn would be. Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin, you don't get to bring more supply online. And so 
you know, you get these massive booms and busts and, and it just, you know, it just really human psychology being what it is, like it results in these massive bubbles and 35 million people out of 7 billion, like, you know, Not it's many. just, there. <laughs> I mean, even at $20,000 Bitcoin, even at like Bitcoin being on the radar and being talked about in the same week by Christine Lagarde and Trump and Powell and Treasury Secretary Munchen, it's still a tiny, tiny blueberry compared to an ocean of capital. And so, I mean, like there's only really one way that price can go and that's up like over the long term. Yet in another happening, you know, so 2020, uh, let's say 2024, you know, I mean, if, like let's, anybody who's held Bitcoin for 210,000 blocks, which is about four years, has always had a positive return measured in USD. So if you just buy Bitcoin with the intent to hold it for four years, well, at least ba based on the past 10 years, you're going to be profitable. Oh, yeah. And now is the time to get in. Just buy a little bit, get yourself comfortable and get going for anyone that doesn't own it. Now, for anyone that doesn't really um, understand and isn't clear on the happening, I want you to go into this before we go. This is my last question. Please explain to everyone so they really have a good understanding of what this means coming up in 2020. Yeah, so based on the rules of the protocol, every four years approximately, it's every 210,000 blocks, the amount of new Bitcoin that get produced gets cut in half. So it used to be 50 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. Then it got cut to 25, then 12 and a half. Then it's going to be 6.25. Then it's going to be 3.125. You know, so the, the rate of emission keeps getting cut. And when it happens next year, uh, approximately in May or June, that rate of emission is going to go lower than the rate of emission of new gold. And then four years later, it's going to get cut in half again. And, you know, w because Bitcoin is strictly limited in amount, we, we have transactional demand and speculative demand when it comes to, like, you know, the, the, the curves. Well, the transactional demand people don't care what the price is of Bitcoin. You know, they, they only hold it for a few seconds at the most to transfer value over a communications channel. So they don't really care what the price is. And then there's the speculative demand. And that's like a dog on LSD chasing a rabbit. I mean, that, that is just, it's so crazy. And, and as I explained earlier, Bitcoin's both a Giffen and a Beblin good. So as the price goes up, that dog chases the rabbit harder. <laughs> um, well, when we, have a, when we have a supply shock, when the supply of Bitcoin, when, when there's a shock there, it takes a while to filter through the market because the prices are set at the edges with that transactional demand and people don't actually care what the price is. It's irrelevant in terms of the price elasticity. Hmm. So it becomes, in my, in, I would assert it's impossible to price the happening in in advance. You have to wait for it to happen and then you have to wait for it to filter over time uh, through this transactional demand component on the pricing. And, and we've seen this happen throughout Bitcoin's history, like when Silk Road got shut down and it's Bitcoin got seized. Like it went, Bitcoin dropped to 60 bucks and a couple months later it was $1,200. Why? Because people had to go buy reacquire $150 million worth of Bitcoin for transactional demand. And they didn't care what the price was because they were just using it for a couple of days. You know, when Mount, you know, different, we have different supply shocks that have happened to Bitcoin and it's always resulted in this massive repricing of Bitcoin. Uh, it's happened after every halvening. It's happened with things like uh, when Silk Road had a bunch of Bitcoin seized. So, you know, I don't think that it can be priced in advance and that just adds to more of the excitement, you know, because there are a bunch of people out there who think they can price it in advance. And so they're all pricing it, buying it and selling it. This is the first network effect of speculation. We got seven of them all taking root for a world reserve settlement currency with a multi-million dollar price in, in current US dollar value. So, I mean, it's just incredibly, ti incredibly yeah. exciting time and you get to bet with your money 
So if you want to keep betting on people like Trump and Powell <laughs> and Munchen and Lagarde and Draghi and Yellen and, you know, these other people who created the crisis, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you want to keep betting on those people, like, go ahead. But if you want to buy some, some schmuck insurance, like buy some Bitcoin. It's insurance against these people be, making really stupid decisions that cause a bunch of damage financially and in people's lives. You know, because yeah. we're talking about your pensions going poof, like evaporating. Right. You know, we're, we're talking about your pensions. We're talking about the value of your bonds. You know, there's $13 trillion of negative yielding debt out there. Why, why, why hold that instead of holding gold or Bitcoin? You know, yeah. if you're not earning any interest, like why hold something that they can just create as many of it as they want out of thin air? Just hold gold instead. And you it's know? such a good point because when you hold um, Bitcoin and gold, you're going to hold your value. The likelihood of it is it's going to explode in value. But um, you put it in the bank and they're literally going into negative interest rates throughout the world. I mean, it's actually going to cost you money. So it really uh, logically, just even if you don't know anything about Bitcoin or gold, logically, you're going to lose money no matter what in your savings account if and when they go negative. Well, well, I think it like that helps highlight the demand for money. We don't usually talk about the demand for money. We talk a lot about the supply. They can just print it out of nothing. But we're talking about the demand for money. And why, why, are they de why is everybody demanding this, these fiat currencies at negative interest rates, right? It's because that's the risk-free rate that all of these financial professionals are using when they're managing the portfolios. But like last I checked, a euro or a dollar is not risk-free. One, we don't know how many they're going to be in a year, let alone in 10 or 20 or 50 years. We, we, don't, we don't even have a definition for it. It's not guaranteed any particular amount of purchasing power. You can't run your own full node. It's confiscatable. Like, what's the new risk-free asset? The fear. That's the, you know, confiscatable, which the Libra is, that is, to me, very frightening. When you have oh, a yeah. currency that's confiscatable by the very people that have proven they will confiscate anything. Yeah, they well, can. <laughs> and, and there's, there's confiscating through stuff like civil forfeiture, where they just take your stuff and make you prove that you got it legally, I guess, or whatever. And then there's confiscation through inflation, which is a form of taxation without representation or due process of law. So Bitcoin, it can't just be confiscated like civil asset forfeiture, and it can't be confiscated through inflation because it's strictly limited in amount and it's immutable. So like, what are you going to do? You're going to protect yourself or are you just going to leave yourself in a, in a very vulnerable, naked position where you, your money can just be taken from you however they want to take it? And it's like, just because I, everybody else does, really, literally. It's just because that's what everybody does. So yeah, I mean, if you want to be la if you want to be lazy, like Bitcoin's going to be is ruthless when it comes to personal responsibility. So if you want to be lazy and don't want to get technologically adept and figure out how to buy and store properly, like and securely your Bitcoin. And instead, just have, be in some dollar cost average mutual fund that they can confiscate through inflation. Uh, good luck, you know. But everybody's got a choice now. So, like, you got a choice. Right. Trace, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everybody how they can follow your work. Yeah, so there's Twitter, at Trace Mayer, and uh, the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, www.bitcoin.kn. I interview a lot of the top people in the Bitcoin space. And thanks so much for having me. I always love to share the message of monetary sovereignty and personal responsibility and choice. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Mr. Trace Mayer, entrepreneur, investor, journalist, and the host of the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast for Cryptocurrencies, the Future of Digital Money Show. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.